kind of wanted to watch a story. This one's about the guy from My Name is Earl. I thoroughly enjoyed the My Name is Earl show, but I didn't know he was a pro skater. Let's check it out. It goes without saying that Jason Lee has had a very interesting and varied career, whether it's skateboarding, acting, or photography. Wait. But how exactly did hey. he... Wait. It just showed that he was the guy from Incredibles. Bottom left. And now that, like... I put the the face and voice to this face. I can see it. I can see that's him. That's crazy. And he was but an how exactly did he transition from sponsored skater to award-winning actor? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be discussing on today's episode of Looking Back. Hmm. Interesting. Jason Lee was born in Santa Ana, California on April 25th, 1970. <laughs> what a picture he made. I couldn't find any pictures of Jason Lee as a baby, so I photoshopped this under the assumption that he was born with an Earl Hickey mustache. <laughs> Great assumption to make. But he actually spent his formative <laughs> years just a few miles down the road in Huntington Beach, California. Growing up in Southern California, Jason's time was split between BMX racing, riding dirt bikes, and Not skateboarding. actually Jason Lee. Oh, there Jason go. first stepped on a skateboard There's when he was about six Jason or seven Lee years footage. old, starting out with a cheap plastic board purchased at a local department store. But he didn't really get serious about skateboarding until he was 14, when he acquired a Veriflex board, which was still store-bought, but a major step up from his previous plastic board. At that point, Jason really began to hone his skateboarding skills. And during his high school years, he continued to develop those skills I alongside- I only got the, the plastic board. I wish I would have continued on the, the skateboarding adventure, but I only was a- fortunate to get the plastic board and we never got anything past that we we got the bikes instead likes of ed templeton and steve robert but jason lee's story as a sponsored skater begins right around 1987 with the formation of a company called sma rocco division the company's founder steve rocco really made whoa. a name for himself as a freestyle skater and eventually became team hey. captain for vision skateboards whoa but those rocco moves. was fired from vision he found himself in a pretty dire situation financially so he took out a cash advance on his credit cards for a sum of about six thousand dollars and used that money to manufacture 500 skateboard decks with the help of skip engblom skip engblom is the entrepreneur responsible for the zephyr surf shop and the zephyr competition team better known as the z boys he was later portrayed by heath ledger in the movie lords of dogtown skip's company sma which Never stands for it. santa monica airlines but heath was operated under the distribution company nhs incorporated best known for manufacturing santa cruz skateboards but Steve Rocco turned around and sold all of the boards he produced with the help of Skip and essentially doubled his money in the process. Slowly but surely, SMA Rocco division started to flourish and the company began snapping up talent from bigger brands. Most notably, Jesse Martinez, Rodney Mullen, and Mike Vallely, three individuals who are now considered legends in the world of skateboarding. And people were definitely left scratching their heads when three riders from Powell Peralta all of a sudden stepped down from the company to ride for Steve Rocco's new, much smaller brand. But how does Jason Lee play into all of this? It turns out that Steve Rocco was attending a trade show in Long Beach, California. This was right around 1987 or 1988, from what I can tell. At the time, Jason was a talented but unsponsored skater. And with the help of his girlfriend, Anne, Jason was introduced to Steve at that trade show. They then made plans to meet up at Hermosa Beach the following day, where Jason ended up doing sort of a brief skate demo for Steve. And as a result of that meeting, Jason landed an amateur level sponsorship with SMA Rocco Division. Damn. But shortly after signing Jason Huge. to the team, SMA Rocco Division rebranded as SMA World Industries. And it turns out that Steve Rocco's company technically wasn't even affiliated with SMA, but the brand was launched with the help of Santa Monica Airlines, so they sort of just stuck with the name. Well, the parent company of SMA, NHS Inc., wasn't happy about that. Therefore, oh. once again, SMA World Industries changed their name, and were now simply known as World Industries. World Industries truly sparked a revolution in skateboarding. Because unlike their competitors, they were determined to push street skating into the mainstream going into the 1990s. Whereas vert skating had pretty much dominated the market for the last decade. They were also the first company that heavily incorporated humor into their board graphics, magazine ads, and videos. World Industries magazine spreads specifically helped them gain notoriety. I feel like that's Jason a pretty big part of the culture these days. So they, they made a pretty big part of the culture now. Damn. Jason Lee experienced a pretty modest amount of success with World Industries, but his skateboarding career took a major turn when he joined the newly formed Blind Skateboards, a subsidiary of World Industries founded by Mark Gonzalez in 1989. With his move to Blind, Jason went from being considered an amateur level skater to a full-fledged professional rider. 
In those humorous magazine ads I just talked about, debatably the most notorious of all was the blind ad that took a direct shot at George Powell and the Powell Peralta brand as a whole. This spread was a response to a magazine ad published by Powell Peralta that made fun of smaller skateboard companies. But those ads were only the beginning, because Blind Skateboards <laughs> turned around and released one of the greatest skate videos of all time in the form of Blind Video Days. Blind Video Days? <clears throat> I like the OG skate footage, it's from like the 90s. Whether it be like CYK or like some jackass shit. <laughs> Video Days not only showcased some absolutely amazing skate parts, but also had an incredible soundtrack and some just batshit crazy skits. And as for Jason's part, it was clear that this guy had a level of charisma capable of rocketing him into something much bigger. Dude, I'll give you a hundred bucks and I'll take out the Denny Hondas if you slide that 75 foot handrail. <laughs> I'll give you 600 tries. I'll be back next week. Lit. But shortly after the release of Video Days, Mark Gonzalez, the founder of Blind Skateboards, left the company. At which point, a 21 year old Jason Lee was pretty much forced into running the brand by himself. Oh. Jason later stated, I honestly didn't know what I was doing. I definitely didn't know about the money and the workings of the business. I just didn't fit that role at the time. I wasn't ready for all that yet. Man, As it was a result, like 21, Jason decided to leave dropped, Blind Skateboards just and then it was 21 was just a whole company dropped on it. I don't think many people would know what to do with that. That is an insane Six situation. Six months after he was appointed to his new position in the company. A decision that was made alongside Jason's good friend and fellow skater, Chris Pastras, who left Blind's parent company, World Industries, at that same time. Chris had plans of starting a new company, and Jason agreed to join him. That company was called Blue Skateboards, formed under the Vision Skateboards brand with the help of its founder, Brad Dorfman. Now, don't feel bad if you don't recognize the name because it didn't last very long. Jason and Chris quickly realized that they needed a devoted team of ambitious graphic designers for their boards, and that was something that they really didn't have access to working under Vision. So within a year of its formation, Blue Skateboards was rebranded as Stereo Skateboards. And with that rebranding, the company shifted away from Vision as its distributor. Instead, they were now working with Deluxe Distribution, who at that time were the parent company of Spitfire Wheels and Real Skateboards. No, I know Spitfire. It didn't take long for Stereo to make a name for itself in the like industry. the only name that's... Not just because of their talented <laughs> roster of skaters, but Stereo's board uh, designs were extremely eye-catching and unique. The brand had a very unique retro design aesthetic that was mostly inspired by classic jazz album covers, which can especially be seen with Stereo's earliest logo. But as Stereo continued to grow, they would eventually release their first full-length skate video in 1993, titled Visual Sound. But around that same time, Jason Lee was toying with the idea of retiring as a professional skateboarder. Damn. Interesting. Going into the mid-1990s, street skating had gained a massive amount of popularity, ushered in by brands such as Toy Machine, Plan B, and Jason Lee's former sponsors, World Industries and Blind. But with that boost in popularity too. came a wave of innovative and talented street skaters. And at the young age of 24, Jason Lee was already feeling like his time as a professional skater was running out. And in 1994, as Jason began to step away from skateboarding, he toyed with the idea of becoming a full-time actor. But don't be mistaken, this wasn't something that he decided on out of the blue. Jason had actually been dipping his toes into the world of acting for a few years by that point. To explain this further, we have to turn the clock back just a bit to 1992. During the filming of Mi Vida Loca, what you're looking at is Mi a young Vida Jason Loca. Lee and Spike Jones in their first credited on-screen acting roles. They were in this movie for maybe Jones. six or seven seconds, but despite that, Jason later described the experience as intimidating. And not long after Mi Vida Loca, Jason once again collaborated with Spike Jones, this time on the music video for the song 100% by Sonic Youth. But for this project, Spike was stepping into the director's chair. Hmm. Well, co-director's chair, alongside Tamara Davis, who had primarily worked on music videos at that point, but would go on to direct a number of cult classics, Some big including names, one yeah, of my personal big. favorites, Billy Madison. Billy Madison, a classic. I had an accident. You had an accident? What does that mean? You! <laughs> and although this music video was filmed after Me Vita Loca, it was classic. actually released before that movie, so this was technically Jason Lee's acting debut, sort of. The video featured multiple clips with Jason skateboarding, but he also got to play a dead guy in the video. And despite playing a character without any lines, Jason later said, I was just stoked to feel like I was in something where I was kind of acting, you know? Something that wasn't just a skate video. Almost like a movie project or something. I got to play dead, trying to do the best acting that I could. Jason then appeared in another music video, this time for the Red Cross song, Jimmy's Fantasy, where, as the star of the video, he had a bit more screen time. With all that out of the way, we can now jump back, or ahead, to 1994, to the pre-production stage for the movie that changed Jason's life forever, Mallrats. 
Mall rat. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever heard of this. Wait, was that uh, uh Jay? I think it was. I forgot their names. I can't like my brain is so dead right now. I can't think of their names. Huh. I don't remember any of his. Mallrats stuff. was the follow-up to Kevin Smith's directorial debut. Clerks. I remember Clerks, but unlike Clerks, Mallrats had the financial backing of a major studio. A few familiar faces from Clerks would be making a return in Mallrats, yeah, but a Jake. casting director was also hired to bring in some established actors for the movie. That casting director was Don Phillips, the man responsible for casting Sean Penn in Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused. Hmm. So it turns out that when casting was being done for Mallrats, Jason Lee was dating Marissa Rabisi, who Don Phillips was familiar with because he had cast her in Days and Confused just a few years prior. Marissa's mom was a manager and representative for writing and acting talent at that time, and she asked Don Phillips to set up a meeting between Jason Lee and Mallrats director Kevin Smith. This wasn't even really a formal audition, it was just intended that Jason Lee would meet with Kevin Smith to sort of get a feel of what it's like to basically sell yourself as an actor in Hollywood. But Kevin Smith, along with his best friend and producer, Scott Mosier, agreed to meet with Jason. And it turns out that he won them over almost immediately, with what Kevin Smith describes as an honest, childlike manner. Shortly after that meeting, Jason was brought in with a group of actors that were auditioning for the role of T.S. Quinn, a character that was eventually played by Jeremy London, twin brother of Jason London, who you might remember from Days of Confused. And the audition went okay, but Kevin and Scott felt that Jason wasn't at all right for the part of T.S., but they found that Jason Lee was just so extremely likable, and they were determined to have him in their movie. So Jason was told to come back and audition for the character of Brody Bruce, and this time, he absolutely killed it. Kevin and Scott were convinced that Jason was their guy for the role of Brody, but casting an actor in a major motion picture released by a huge studio isn't that simple. So Jason was once again told to come back for a final audition. And as much as Kevin and Scott wanted Jason to play Brody, there was actually another actor up for the role who had a bit more on-camera experience than Jason. Kevin Ooh. Smith has never confirmed who that actor was, eh. but they were apparently a shoe in for the role. No, come Unfortunately, on. that actor absolutely bombed in front of the studio executives during final auditions. Jason Lee, on the other hand, absolutely crushed his audition. I wonder who it was. And he was the clear choice for the role of Brody. With casting out of the way, production on Mallrats officially began oh, in no, 1995. <laughs> As shooting began, cool. it was originally intended that Jeremy London's character, T.S., would be the main character of the movie. But as production went on, Kevin Smith alleges that Jason Lee's performance was so captivating and magnetic that the focus of the movie was shifted away from T.S. and over to Brody. All of a sudden, this scrappy, 24-year-old retired professional skater with almost no acting experience, who wasn't even sure if he was going to be cast in the movie to begin with, was the main protagonist of Mallrats. Damn. As production wrapped up, spirits were high. Not only among the cast and crew, he but the studio like, executives the at Universal were convinced that with Mallrats, they had a box office hit on their hands. At least that's what it sounds hands. like. Hey, wait, is that Randy? That looks like Randy. That looks like the man who he meets in the My Name is Earl. At Universal, were convinced that with Mallrats, they had a box office hit on their hands. Maybe not. Well, that movie looks the next film is Mall Rats, a dismal would-be comedy about kids hanging out at the mall. And I was huh? caught by surprise by this picture when I realized it was made by the same director who made one of the freshest films of last year, Clerks. I sat stone-faced throughout Mall Rats, not laughing once. Rent Clerks instead of oh, seeing Mall Rats. I'm totally in agreement with you on this. Unfortunately, oh, those predictions couldn't have been more wrong. As Mall Rats made just over one million dollars its opening weekend, oh, no. by the end of its run, the film made a total of two million dollars on a six million dollar budget and was declared a box office bomb. Despite oh, all of that, critics who otherwise hated the movie also couldn't help but mention that Jason Lee was both a bright spot and a big find. The only thing that saved it is this guy here. Hi, I'm Bentley Garrison with the network. Me and Mason here thought you were as Larry. Clearly, Kevin Smith felt the same way because he turned around and began production on another movie. Once again, casting Jason Lee in a lead role. This time, as Banky Edwards in the 1997 film, Chasing Amy. I, f I remember this one. I haven't seen Chasing it like Amy forever, was truly but I a return it. to form for Kevin Smith, as the movie was produced with, essentially, a shoestring budget. Initially, the production company that financed Chasing Amy, Miramax, Miramax. was willing to spend about $3 million on the movie but only if the three main characters were played by Jon Stewart, Drew Barrymore, and David Schwimmer. And say what you will about Kevin Smith, but the guy is loyal names. to his friends. 
because he told Miramax that he would take just $250,000 to produce Chasing Amy, but only if they allowed him to cast Jason Lee, Ben Affleck, and Joey Lauren Adams in the movie. Miramax accepted that deal, much to the chagrin of producer Scott Mosier, who now had to figure out a way to produce a movie with 1 24th the budget utilized on Mallrats. Nonetheless, the film was eventually completed, and ended up making over $15 million worldwide during its theatrical run. Once again, Damn. not that big of a number, but unlike Mallrats, Chasing Amy was highly profitable. Yeah, they Jason used Lee a lot received less high money. praise for his performance as Banky Edwards, and was even nominated at the Independent Spirit Awards in the Best Supporting Male Actor category. And I can't make okay. this shit up. Not yeah. only did Jason win the award against Samuel L. Jackson, I might add, but he was also up against Roy Scheider, who played Chief Martin Brody in Jaws. <laughs> the character what? that inspired the name of Brody. Bro, this guy, like, stole the show on everything he was a part of so far. Like, Mallrats chasing Amy. Like, he just kind of came in and he's doing it. <laughs> like, holy shit, he beat Samuel L. Jackson and the guy from Jaws. That is insane. Some Mallrats. But after the success of Chasing Amy, Jason Lee's acting career really popped. Over the next few years, he appeared in films such as Almost Famous, Enemy of the State, and Vanilla Sky. And in 2004, Chasing Jason Amy's made his voice acting debut of. in the Disney Pixar movie The Incredibles. Oh, and this voicing one. probably of one of the best villains in Pixar history, Syndrome. You? But married? honestly, I didn't know until like 15 minutes ago that this was him. Like, <laughs> I didn't know that. Elastic girl. <laughs> and got busy. Through all of his success. Jason remained a frequent collaborator with Kevin Smith. And even though Mallrats was absolutely lambasted by critics upon its initial release, the movie actually gained a cult following once it was released on home video, specifically oh, with a younger generation who found that it was super relatable. Also, if not for that movie, Jason Lee might not have met his future no, Mighty Israel co-star, Ethan Randy. Seeply. So I made a list of everything bad I've ever done, and one by one I'm gonna make up for all my mistakes. I'm just trying to be a better person. It's such a fun my show, name man. Is Earl. My name is Earl. <laughs> When Greg Garcia wrote the pilot for My Name is Earl, he had one actor in mind for the titular role. At the time, Jason was uninterested in working on television, and ultimately turned down the role two times before agreeing to read the script. But once he read it, he was all in. I feel and like at this time of like uh, film and stuff, people were so scared to get on TV compared to like these days. Nowadays, it feels like people are like, yeah, okay, I'll go be a part of like a, a show, why not? But when it came to shows back in the day, it, it felt like if you're going to a TV show, it's almost like you're giving away your film shit. It's kind of weird. Enough, it was purely a coincidence that Ethan Supley was cast as Earl's brother, Randy. But the fact that Jason and Ethan had previously collaborated only made the show better. Critical reception of My Name is Earl was overwhelmingly positive. But unfortunately, the show was canceled due to declining viewership ratings. Yeah, you too. Which one are you from NBC? Oh, thanks for canceling My Name! That's right. While My Name is Earl was running, Jason's involvement with The Incredibles a few years earlier led him to dabble in a few more projects aimed at a younger audience, such as Monster House. Who's this? It's Bones. What's up? He's Underdog. Bones! Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. You can understand me? <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. And Alvin and the Chipmunks. Alvin and the Chipmunks, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up. It's about to get stinky. <laughs> When this movie hit theaters, I was about 15 years old, and I was Same, just so I disappointed think. when I saw Jason Lee's face on the poster. Admittedly, in that moment, I probably called him a sellout. But now, as an adult who has bills to pay, I totally understand why he signed on for not just one, but four of those movies. We all get it. <laughs> At the end of the day, Jason got a massive paycheck, and we got some absolutely hilarious interview footage out of these movies. Was this project pretty much a no-brainer for all you guys? For me, yes, it was, absolutely. They called and said, we want you above and beyond any other actor in Hollywood. And I said, of course, I'll be there. <laughs> okay. After the magnum opus that was Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Road Chip, Jason Lee's acting career slowed down a bit. Over the next few years, I he would mostly that. take part in voiceover work. But while Jason Lee's acting career took a bit of a pause, he spent more time pursuing another passion of his, photography. Jason has actually been shooting photos since the early to mid 2000s, but began publishing photography books in 2016. He specializes yeah. in photographs of rural America for the most part. But before I close this video out, I wanted to circle back just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, man went from uh, like a pro skateboarder to a film star to a photographer. Now that's crazy. And he was an owner of a company at one point. Yeah, absolutely. When crazy. Jason Lee retired from skateboarding back in 1995, it turns out that his retirement was pretty short-lived. In 2003, 
Jason began skateboarding once again. Aww, and at yeah. the time, his former Stereo Skateboards partner Chris Pastris was working as team manager at Osiris Shoes. Once Jason and Chris linked back up and began skating together, they almost immediately relaunched the Stereo brand. Stereo Skateboards is still going strong today. Oh, really? Oh, damn. Hmm. And that'll well, do it for crazy. today's video. I had so much. I found out so much about this guy. I only knew that he was Earl, but now I know so much more about him. Uh, surprised you didn't mention his stint in Scientology? This guy's crazy, he's done a lot. That was cool. I enjoyed that.